Hello and welcome to this BPAL signature event. Harvard Speaks on Climate Change, Federal Climate Rules, a status report is brought to you by Harvard's Office of the Vice Provost for Advances in Learning and the Salata Institute for Climate and Sustainability in partnership with the Harvard Alumni Association. Vice Provost for Climate and Sustainability and Director of the Salata Institute, Jim Stock, will host. Without further ado, Jim, the virtual floor is yours. Thanks so much, and welcome to this edition of Harvard Speaks on Climate Change. A core goal of the Salata Institute is to drive impactful research by Harvard faculty and students on climate change, sustainability, and the energy transition. To that end, the Institute supports cross-school research on climate and environmental sustainability with a focus on impact at scale. This series takes the broad Harvard community on a virtual tour of our faculty's research and engagement on climate and sustainability. Each hour focuses on a different topic featuring one or two faculty members. Today, we will focus on one of the pillars of reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the United States, environmental regulation. The Biden administration has been pursuing climate policy on both legislative and regulatory fronts. One of its regula regulations aims to cut CO2 emissions in the power sector. Another set of regulations aims to cut emissions from the transportation sector. In fact, just a few hours ago, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency released a very important final rule aimed at sharply reducing CO2 emissions from cars and light trucks, and I'm sure we'll discuss that. Separately, two weeks ago, the Securities and Exchange Commission released a final rule on climate risk disclosure by publicly traded companies. To guide us through all this, we're indeed fortunate to have Jody Freeman with us today. It is serendipitous that we are having this conversation on the day that EPA released its new tailpipe standards for light duty vehicles, because Jody was the architect of the historically ambitious round of standards negotiated by the Obama administration in 2009 and 2010, and on which today's final rulemaking builds. Since then, Jody has remained deeply engaged in reducing emissions through existing law and in the development of this administration's climate regulations. More generally, Jody is one of the premier experts on U.S. administrative and environmental law. Here at Harvard, she is the Archibald Cox Professor of Law at Harvard Law School and founding director of the Environmental and Energy Law Program at the Law School. With that, Jody, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Jim. And thanks, everybody. I, I'm really happy to be joining you to talk about these uh, very important climate rules. As Jim mentioned, there are really uh, a few signature regulations that I want to talk about today, primarily focusing on the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, covering the rules Jim mentioned, a greenhouse gas rule for power plants that covers power sector emissions, a greenhouse gas rule, more specifically methane rule for the oil and gas sector that EPA has finalized, and the light duty vehicle rule that Jim mentioned that serendipitously did get finalized just today. So everything I say will be hot off the presses uh, and of course, subject to refinement later, but we do have some good news to share with you about this rule. So those are three major climate rules. Um, two of them are now finished, but the power sector rule still has not been finalized. And we'll talk about the state that it is in and what we can expect. The other topic I want to mention today is the Securities and Exchange Commission regulation, which focuses on corporate disclosure of climate-related financial risk. And this is a new rule, highly anticipated, and I'll go over the takeaways of that final rulemaking too. This together really comprises the major effort of the Biden administration in the first term to issue profoundly important uh, and ambitious climate regulations. And by the time we're done, I hope you have a sense of the broad contours of those rules. Before I talk about each of them specifically, I want to mention important context, and Jim alluded to this as well. In the background, of course, is Congress having passed the Inflation Reduction Act, in addition to the infrastructure bill the prior year, 
And those two pieces of legislation are very important as background for these regulations. And the reason is not just because this is a historic investment that Congress has made in clean energy and transition related tax credits and subsidies. That's true and it is historic and it's very important and it will unlock, it's hoped, a lot of private investment as well. But what's important for our talk is that the Inflation Reduction Act paired with the infrastructure bill helps to create a template of lower cost for new technologies. And that lowering of the cost makes it more possible for EPA and other regulators to set standards because it'll be less expensive for businesses to comply since new technologies, things like carbon capture and sequestration, which of course isn't even new, but nevertheless, new technologies like carbon capture and green hydrogen, for example, are being heavily subsidized by the Inflation Reduction Act investments. So again, what's important here is that they work in tandem. Congress has passed legislation that also makes it more likely that regulators can impose more demanding requirements on industry and polluters because the cost of achieving those standards should be more achievable. So with that as background, I want to move to the other piece of context, which of course I can't resist, which is the United States Supreme Court. When we talk about these rules, we will wind up talking about their vulnerability to litigation, whether they will hold up upon judicial review. And to understand the risk here, it's important for everyone to know that the Supreme Court decided what's a major case, what's considered a, a major and profoundly worrying to many decision in the West Virginia case, which is by now quite well known, but I wanted to touch on it to make sure we all understood it. Because in West Virginia, the Supreme Court decided that an earlier version of the power sector rule, which was the Obama administration's effort to control carbon emissions from power plants, that that rule was unlawful. They struck it down and they didn't need to take this case because the rule had never been implemented. We can talk more about that if you have questions about why, but the rule had never gone into effect it had been stayed by the Supreme Court before it ever became binding. And yet this Supreme Court took a challenge to the Obama era rule and struck it down. And in that case, West Virginia sort of created a, a new context for the current EPA and the Biden administration to decide what it was going to do about power sector rules. And we can talk about the importance of West Virginia and how far reaching it is. But for our purposes here, what I want you to understand is that the court rejected an approach in which the EPA said, we're going to lower emissions from the power sector, taking a system wide look at the entire interconnected grid. And we're going to consider how much substitution of dirty energy uh, we can displace using cleaner energy like wind and solar. So just for our purposes, it's important to understand that's called generation shifting. That is shifting clean generation in and dirty generation of electricity out. That approach was struck down by the court. And that creates a narrower lane, a narrower zone of options for the EPA when it wants to regulate power plants going forward. There's an important set of holdings in this case. The reasoning is really important, but for our purposes, it's just a case in which the court said, this is too big a deal what the Obama administration tried to do. It has major political and economic consequences. And in order to exercise that kind of authority, they need very specific authority from Congress, which they don't have. So announced the Supreme Court. So with that context, a constraining decision by the court, the court going out of its way to send this message to EPA, that creates a certain background for us to understand the now Biden administration version of these rules. And it takes us to the power sector rule that Jim mentioned that I wanted to talk about. The heart of this rule actually is very intuitive. It's complicated when you read the rule itself, but it's intuitive when you boil it down. And it works like this. There's a sliding scale of stringency that power plants have to meet. They have to meet emission limits, a standard that is based on a sliding scale, depending on these factors. The type of plant, is it a coal plant or natural gas plant? how long it's expected to operate. If it's gonna retire soon, the requirements to control emissions are lower than if it's expected to have a long life and go, for example, beyond 2040. 
And another consideration is how much will it operate? If the plant's expected to be what we call baseload or operate a lot or all the time, the emission standards are tougher. So that makes intuitive sense. And I'll just give you a couple of examples without getting in too, too much into the weeds. For example, the emission rate that EPA uh, set, that is the standard it sets for these, uh, this pollution, is based on carbon capture and sequestration. If it's a baseload plant, meaning it's going to operate a lot, and it's going to live beyond 2040. And that makes sense. Being able to reach a level of control that is accomplishable only if you have carbon capture and sequestration would make sense if you intend to run your coal plant forever and uh, if you expect to run it all the time. Compare that to a less demanding standard, which would be based on, say, co-firing, burning some amount of gas, natural gas with your coal, or some amount of hydrogen, if you're running a natural gas plant, co-firing might be required if um, you're going to retire the plant sooner or operate it less often or less capacity. So those are the building blocks. Those are the principles of the rule. It gets very complex. I'll show you one complex example if you'll bear with me on one slide that's a little too complicated, but it does illustrate what I'm talking about. And so we can really understand the, the power plant regulation that's been proposed. Here's what the proposal would do. Picture a plant that expects to live beyond 2040. It's expected to meet the strictest standard, which is carbon capture and sequestration with a 90% uh, reduction in emissions. So picture a coal plant that expects to live that long. Um, compared to that, picture a plant that would retire before 2040. And you see here, um, the comparison would be that it would be required to co-fire with a certain percentage of natural gas. Compare that to a plant that may operate at say 20% of its capacity, and would retire before 2035, that plant can continue to emit according to its emissions rate that it's always been emitting. So less stringent control on a plant that would be retiring sooner and operating less. And finally, retiring before 2032, if you're a coal plant that's gonna retire pretty soon, you can operate at your historic emission rate. So this just shows you alternative pathways to comply with EPA's new rules for power plants, depending on the type of plant, how long it's going to operate, and how much it operates. There are other examples like this that illustrate the rule, but I think that gets the main point across. And if you have questions, we can talk later. What's important about this rule that was just announced is it's not finished, and EPA is expected to finalize it in, in April. Uh, the second thing to know is that they recently announced, the agency recently announced, it will not cover existing gas plants. That was a controversial decision, and we can talk about that when we take questions too. But it has narrowed the rule to coal plants and new natural gas plants for now. Key issues at, to watch as you watch the agency finish this rule and issue a final version is timing. The compliance dates I just showed you, 2035, 2040, when they, when they have to get into compliance and the retirement dates, those may shift around a little. Finally, it's not finally, sorry, second, um, the technologies that EPA has identified here, they have an obligation to use technologies that are, quote, adequately demonstrated. Some people are concerned about whether the technology is being considered carbon capture and sequestration, uh, co-firing with uh, clean hydrogen, whether they are quote unquote adequately demonstrated and whether that will be challenged by people in litigation. Another issue to look for is how EPA handles infrastructure considerations for the energy transition. For example, they're establishing this rule, expecting there to be the opportunity for CCS and expecting there to be opportunities for co-firing with hydrogen, et cetera. And that will depend to some extent on the ability to build out the transportation and storage for CCS and hydrogen and a build out for transmission. So these things will be fodder for challengers to say, the rule 
is too ambitious, for example, because we are expecting infrastructure uh, build out to happen more quickly than it really will. That's what a challenger might assert. And another thing to look for is how EPA handles reliability concerns, wanting to make sure that, that as the grid gets greener, as these plants meet tougher standards, uh, there are no reliability issues or they're manageable. And finally, the role of the states in implementing these standards, the states uh, have some flexibility to take into account things like remaining useful life of these plants. States will have some ability to manage which plants are affected uh, because they have to develop the implementation plans for existing sources. So the final thing I wanted to show you about this proposed rule is the modeled emission reductions, the greenhouse gas reductions. Again, this is a little bit complicated slide, but it boils down quite nicely to this, um, a model that shows about seven to nine percent annual lower emissions of greenhouse gases if this rule is in place compared to if it's not. And one reaction you could have to that is, well, that doesn't seem like such a big deal. Why do you need this rule? And I think the right way to look at it, and we can talk about it more, but the right way to look at it is actually seven to nine percent lower emissions over the baseline case on an annual basis is pretty significant, especially if you're trying to reach the target that the U.S. is trying to reach for the Paris Agreement, our commitment to the Paris Agreement, which is 50 to 52 percent below 2005 levels of emissions for us nationally. Every little bit counts, and I think this is a significant contribution. But the other way to look at it is this is regulation creating an ongoing kind of driver for market trends. This continues a market signal that says we're moving in this direction in the power sector toward a cleaner grid. And the rule is helping to um, drive the transitions that utilities have to make, the plans they have to uh, uh, create, and the investments they have to make in order to succeed. So the regulatory driver, I think, is still very important. The next rule I wanted to talk about is the methane rules for the oil and gas sector. This is comprised of three things that the EPA is doing. The Environmental Protection Agency is, uh, first of all, setting standards under the very same section of the Clean Air Act that they use to set the power sector standards, Section 111. Um, these are standards that apply to a much bigger uh, set of components in the oil and gas sector than ever before. For the first time, the standards apply to existing sources of methane, which of course is the bulk uh, of the methane uh, emissions from this sector. It's a comprehensive rule and it's aimed at requiring emitters of methane in the oil and gas value chain to monitor more often, detect methane emission, fugitive emissions or leaks more often with a duty to repair those leaks and we've not had this combination of requirements ever before, especially not for existing sources. It also includes a super emitter program for those large events where there are massive plumes of methane that often go undetected. And I'll talk about the super emitter program in a moment, but that's another signature piece uh, of the rule. So that is the first thing EPA is doing, the methane rule, um, the standards from EPA, the second thing it's doing is updating greenhouse gas reporting rule. Congress has asked EPA, has told EPA to do that uh, so that emitters of methane uh, are required to try to be more empirical, try to get more accurate emissions data, uh, because often methane goes undetected. It's, in, it's invisible, it's odorless. And so the updating those rules is aimed at better reporting. And finally, EPA is involved in implementing a methane fee that Congress passed as part of the Inflation Reduction Act that requires emitters to pay a certain fee uh, per metric ton of methane if they don't comply with the Clean Air Act standards that EPA is setting in that first bullet. So the methane fee is a kind of backup requirement uh, built into the IRA that says, if you're not going to be in compliance with the regulation, you're going to wind up paying a fee. These three steps all work together. EPA is working on all of them. They've completed the first and the second two are in process. The other thing to just note is there's a a, a broader set of methane policies the you know, uh, Biden administration is working on, and it involves the Department of the Interior setting um, a, a standard for emissions on public lands. It involves the Department of Transportation, which is 
uh, responsible for pipelines and emission uh, escaping from pipelines. It involves the Department of Energy and the Department of Justice as well involved in enforcement. So we have a multi-agency effort on methane happening with EPA in the lead, but the other agencies are very important as well. I wanted to mention the super emitter program, I said, because I think it's quite innovative. Um, this is the first time that third parties, so imagine um, the Environmental Defense Fund and uh, in partnership with Harvard and others uh, flying uh, satellites um, to detect methane. There are many third parties that could participate in methane detection, and this program allows them, providing they're certified, uh, to do so to notify the EPA that they've detected uh uh, a super emitter event. The EPA will then go and uh, investigate. And if it proves to be a, a real event, to go communicate with the company that's thought to be responsible or companies responsible, give them a chance to say, it's ours, it's not ours, or to have a back and forth with the agency and to investigate the matter. And then if it is, in fact, their uh, responsibility, there's an uh, obligation to correct that, uh, that emissions leak and ultimately to make sure that it's properly addressed. And all of this happens sequentially with the involvement, the kickoff event being the third party certification entity that detects the leak. So I think this is an aid to EPA in enforcing the methane rules, and it's meant to be a, a really important way for people to participate in methane uh, reduction. The third rule uh, I wanted to talk about is the one Jim mentioned that was finalized just today and is close to my heart because of my prior involvement during the Obama administration, and that is the greenhouse gas standards for light duty vehicles for cars and trucks. You're probably experiencing these in the real world as fuel efficiency standards, but the way EPA sets these standards is in terms of pollution. So they talk about grams of CO2 per mile, and that's what these standards are about. EPA issued the final rule today. We're all very excited. And so you're getting this in real time. This is a little bit complicated, but if you focus with me on the takeaways here, the proposed rule included this set of standards for grams per mile. If you look at the top, the figure 186, that's 186 grams of CO2 per mile. That's the standard set for 2026. And the idea following the column down is for that number to be lower, right? Less CO2 pollution per mile as time goes by. So by the time you get to 2032, the standard for how much pollution a vehicle can, on average, a fleet can emit is your average values across the fleet. Um, is 82 uh, grams per mile. The final rule issued today does something slightly different from the proposal, contemplated by the proposal, so it's within the realm of what EPA was considering. They made this adjustment, and you see now the new values, slightly different. And what you really pick up if you look from the 168 down the column to the bottom is um, the grams per mile, they progress a little more slowly in the earlier years and a little more quickly in the later years. And what that does for the auto industry is it pushes off the compliance obligation a little bit. So in their view, they need, because in their view, they need time. They need time for more electric vehicle infrastructure, for example. They need time for consumers to begin to adopt these cars in greater volumes. This is their argument. And EPA has accommodated some of these arguments by creating a slower ramp up time and putting more of the burden on the out years. You see at the end of this, they do achieve 85 grams per mile, very close to the proposal, a little bit less stringent, but not materially different. And so my takeaway for you listening to this is when you hear people say, oh, these rules have been badly weakened or the you know Biden administration has pulled way well back on its ambition. I don't really think that reflects reality. I think what's happened is here's what happens a lot of the time with regulations after the comment period, taking into account stakeholders, especially the auto industry's needs, the agency adjusts the timeline, the um, compliance deadlines, but doesn't really give up on its ultimate goal, the stringency that it's seeking by 2032. I want to show you this again. It looks complicated, but I want to make it simple. 
All you're looking at here is the three different pathways that EPA is showing for how the auto industry can comply with this rule. And the takeaway message is here at the end of this chart in the right-hand side. If you look at the values here, the 29%, 3%, 13%, and 56%, what are you seeing? You're seeing a breakdown of the types of vehicles that could be produced and comply with this new rule. So 29% internal combustion engines, regular gasoline-powered cars, 13% um, plug-in hybrid vehicles, and all-electric 56%. If you just focus with me on those four categories, what you're seeing is that's one scenario, one pathway for the auto uh, industry to comply with the rule. And the message is you can comply and still make internal combustion engines, and they'd be 30% of the uh, production of cars and trucks. The second pathway is just below it. And the second pathway shows you a different breakdown. Um, few, slightly fewer internal combustion engines, regular gasoline power cars, more uh, hybrid electric or all electric cars. And what you see here is in every scenario shown, all three, there is still a significant share of the cars and trucks being manufactured in 2032 uh, that comprise internal combustion engines. And the message EPA is trying to send by showing this chart is that it's not true that the only way to comply with these ambitious standards is to only produce all electric vehicles, that there are multiple ways to comply and the auto industry will have flexibility. So I wanted to share that with you because you're gonna be hearing some narratives coming out in the media about this rule and litigation will be launched challenging this rule. And I want you to see that EPA has in fact laid out the various ways that the industry can comply. The other thing I wanted to mention to you because it might be confusing if you see this decision come out, there is ongoing litigation in the DC Circuit Court of Appeals challenging the last round of car standards that the Biden EPA put out they have already finished a first round that applies to model years 2023 to 2026, so bear with me here. They had to first go fix the car standards that the Trump administration badly weakened that last from 2023 to 2026, uh, those model years. They had already done that, and yet, uh, and, and they were immediately challenged in litigation. There are three separate cases challenging uh, what the Biden administration did to set new standards for cars and trucks for those model years. Uh, those are the three cases listed up there. But I wanted to mention it because probably this spring, the D.C. Circuit will be issuing rulings in whether the standards they set for those model years are legal uh, whether they're going to be upheld. Uh, they're also going to be ruling on whether California can retain its special status under the Clean Air Act to set its own separate standards. That's known as the California waiver. And they're going to rule on whether the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration used the right methodology or an appropriate methodology for setting fuel efficiency standards. That basket of issues is caught up in these three cases, all of which took place in a, in a long, epic oral argument uh, last September, and we expect the DC Circuit to rule on them this spring. It's consequential because if those standards are struck down, perhaps that's a signal about the stricter standards that EPA is now setting for the out years that were just finalized today. So we're watching that litigation for signs of what the DC Circuit thinks about the challenges that are being made. We expect litigation on these new standards to be imminent. But it's interesting that I don't think it's going to come from the auto industry. There were no auto companies suing in any of these cases that were heard in the D.C. Circuit. And if you read the news today, you've got the uh, Trade Association for the Auto Industry and individual auto companies saying that EPA has uh, done something they appreciate, which is to help them comply and there's some very supportive statements coming out of the car industry, what, uh, the auto industry. What's happening here is that these challenges are from uh, Republican uh, state attorneys general and fuel producers, but not the auto industry itself. The final topic I wanted to cover is climate-related financial disclosures, which is a hot topic and something that California has legislated about, the EU uh, has set standards, and now the Securities and Exchange Commission just a couple of weeks ago 
issued its much awaited final rule. This is a complicated chart, but just focus with me here. The SEC rule applies to publicly traded companies and the final rule phases in the requirements for them to disclose a certain material facts about their climate related risks their businesses face, about their GHG emissions and their management of climate related risk. And that'll phase in starting with their 2026 filings with the SEC. The controversy over this rule is the challengers argue the Securities and Exchange Commission should not be wading into climate matters, that it has no business regulating climate-related financial disclosure. And the response that the SEC has given very robustly is, this is absolutely part of our duty to protect investors. That's our legal statutory duty. And we are taking no position on what companies should do about climate change. All we're doing is saying they need to disclose their transition planning, disclose their GHG emissions so investors can appreciate the risks they're taking. That's very much in line with the SEC's historical role, uh, which is to protect investors. And the only comparison I'll draw here is California has passed legislation requiring uh, businesses that have $500 million in annual revenue in the state to make climate-related financial risk disclosures. And they've also said that companies with at least a billion in annual revenue need to disclose their emissions in the state. So we have three separate regimes, the European Union, California, the SEC rule. We're seeing a lot of activity around trying to force companies to disclose more about their approach to tr uh, energy transition risk. And the SEC rule uh, is the latest piece of that puzzle. The other thing I want to mention is this final rule announced just recently was uh, different from the proposal. It made a big change here. Um, only scope one and two emissions, those of you who know, those are the emissions directly responsible, the companies are directly responsible for, only those are required to be disclosed, not what's called scope three emissions, which go further down the value chain and affect how their products are used. Those emissions aren't part of this rule. They were part of the proposal. And there's a very important qualifier that the SEC inserted here, which is materiality, only if these emissions are viewed as material. Um, second, a variety of other things that uh, companies have to disclose about their governance practices related to climate change and how they're managing risks and the impact on their operations from weather events and various other things, they're all qualified by a materiality. Uh, requirement. And so um, th there's significant sort of a caveats or conditions imposed in the final rule that weren't necessarily there in the proposed rule. And they're narrower and less prescriptive. The proposal overall is narrower and less prescriptive in response to comments and concern about legal risk and wanting to make sure the rule was on solid legal ground. The final piece I wanted to mention to you is a uh, an important piece of this final rule is a safe harbor provision so that Companies that disclose about their climate-related targets and their sustainability plans and their transition plans and their net zero plans, they are not liable in litigation for any forward-looking statements. And that was a very important protection to try to encourage companies to be more forward-leaning and not be fearful that they would be sued for not being able to meet those targets. So the safe harbor from litigation provision is really quite important, I think, here. The last thing I'll say before turning to questions is just to gesture toward the election because some of you may have questions about that. I think these rules uh, needed to be finished uh, now this spring for several reasons. You can see them, uh, EPA and other agencies rushing to finish in time. Why is that? Because it's possible that if the election were to bring a different president uh, into the White House and if Congress were to flip into Republican hands, um, Congress could use something called the Congressional Review Act, a law that allows it to retroactively disapprove rules that are within 60 legislative days of being passed. So it's it's sort of an almost six-month reach back that Congress can do and essentially cancel legally adopted rules uh, if the president, a new president, presumably would sign that disapproval. So in order to avoid that problem, the agency has to finish these before that six-month deadline. Um, the other possibility, of course, is if presuming that it is going to be President Trump the nominee, presuming in this imagination that he were to win, um, the fear would be about regulatory rollbacks and reversals. Some of these rules are more vulnerable to that than others. Uh, we can talk a little about that, but that's a concern about what could happen after the election. It would be, in essence, Trump 
to, for example, since the first Trump administration rolled back or tried to roll back many rules and wound up in trouble in the courts. Third thing to think about when thinking about the election is the role of the states. If we're in a situation where federal leadership wanes on climate change, um, what role can states pick up? The states that are so inclined to adopt climate policies or clean energy policies. The other thing to think about is the role of business, of course, in the absence of federal leadership and the absence of regulation on climate. I think there are many opportunities uh, for businesses now, and especially spurred on by the investment subsidies and tax credits of the Inflation Reduction Act, are seeing a lot of uptake uh, in the business community. So we're looking to see, well, what progress can be made, even if um, there were a White House not interested in climate policy. And of course, I cannot help myself but say the other thing to think about, of course, top of mind, and it's not specific to the election, of course, but the Supreme Court of the United States. Um, all of the rules I've discussed uh, either are currently being challenged or if they haven't yet become final, when they do, they will be legally challenged. And the question will be, what appetite does the Supreme Court have uh, to grant review in cases concerning these rules? How far will the Supreme Court go in cutting back agency authority and limiting what EPA and other agencies can do? I mentioned the West Virginia case at the top of the call because that set the tone uh, for how the court is feeling about ambitious regulation coming from EPA, saying that they were uh, relying on an old statute without specific enough direction to do something big and ambitious, and that was not permissible. I think we are concerned right now that the Supreme Court is in a deeply anti-regulatory mood, and we're waiting to hear whether it will overturn a longstanding precedent that grants deference to agencies when they interpret ambiguous provisions in their authorizing statutes. That case is called Chevron. Some of you know about it. But it's possible that the court will uh, double down on its constriction of agency authority by overturning Chevron and basically saying on matters of interpreting laws delegated to you, expert agencies, we're giving you no deference. We, the court, will decide. And that would be quite cataclysmic. Uh, potentially so. So we're waiting and watching because what the Supreme Court does in a series of cases that are before it now, one called the one on Chevron uh, concerning Chevron is called Loper Bright. Uh, will the court overrule Chevron? We'll have a lot to say about how EPA and other agencies approach uh, future rulemakings. So I'll leave it there. I'm happy to take questions of all stripes, and I think Jim will be helping moderate. That's terrific. There is <laughs> there is a, a lot to talk about there. We have some questions about specific rules, and I certainly do too. But I'd actually like to start at a, a somewhat higher or more general level than the specific rules. So first one, you are a real expert on U.S. administrative law. So I have some baby questions on U.S. administrative law that perhaps you could just explain, okay? There's proposed rules. There's final rules. At some point, you get to litigate. Maybe you could explain that pathway and why we're here. And why did the administration have to wait like till now to do this final rule, for heaven's sakes, and then worry? about the Congressional Review Act. But then sort of the more complicated thing is I know that sometimes you don't have to actually propose a rule. You can just finalize a rule. You can just like do it under some circumstances. Maybe you could just like explain the timeline here and, and clarify some of this. In the normal course, an agency um, takes, even at its fastest, working as hard as it can on a complicated rule that involves considering technology that's available, considering costs of uh, the regulation, considering uh, industry trends, and all the things that by law they have to take into account and taking public comment, which in these rules, since they're so important and so many uh, stakeholders are interested in them, can take months of comment. In order to do this properly, it's very difficult for an agency to do this in less than a year or two, even working hard, even well-resourced agencies. Picture EPA, which is responsible for all these major uh, greenhouse gas rules, is under the gun. And so I don't think the agency has been slow. They've had to be careful legally to make sure they're not vulnerable or as, as absolutely rock solid as they can be to survive judicial review. If you consider all that, plus the back and forth, as you know, Jim, and many of our listeners know between the White House and the agency and the Department of Justice and all the interagency process that's required um, 
it's actually hard, extremely hard to do a rule in less than a couple of years. So they are racing against the clock. They're doing these things simultaneously. They're trying to be responsive to comment. When a rule is final, so-called final, it then takes a little time to appear in the federal register, and then it becomes legally effective, meaning it's binding in 30 days uh, after it appears in the federal register. And typically in the normal course, once that clock has run, everybody is automatically now bound to this rule. In other words, the compliance dates begin to run and industry has to start planning, et cetera. What's happened more recently, and especially with the clean power plan, the, the power plan standards that date to the Obama era, the Supreme Court back in 2015, I believe, stayed the clean power plan. In other words, before any court had heard a challenge, a lower court, Supreme Court stayed the rule. And what we're now seeing more frequently is courts trying to stay rules before they ever become implemented. That flips on its head the normal administrative law practice, the expectation, the precedent for decades, which is the rules when they are final and legally effective, they are in place and considered lawful until a court overturns them. So that's one very important part. Stay, what you see challengers, the state attorneys general from the Republican-led states, what they're seeking very frequently are stays. They want to kill the rules in the cradle before they can ever become legally effective. That's extremely helpful. And I think it, 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 it's not just EPA that has to handle all of these really important rules, but it's actually within EPA. It's only a division or whatever a division. I mean, this is the EPA office of the air and radiation. And, you know, so so you have and I can go into why. And I've had experience with these. the staff are incredibly talented. You know, when people malign agency officials and stuff and they talk about career staff and they say these terrible things about government bureaucrats and stuff, I, I have no relationship to that because the people I worked with at EPA, the people I worked with in every agency I worked with were just so incredibly hardworking and so dedicated and so devoted. But no matter how hard they're working, they can only handle so many regulations at the same time, right? They're very complicated rule packages with very robust legal defenses, super detailed, supportive technical documents. If you go look at these rulemaking records, it's unbelievably competent and detailed and comprehensive. Just the uh, light duty vehicle rule that came out today uh, is, uh, I have it up and it's 1181 pages. And it's in, it's particularly impressive that you're getting tables and charts out of these 1181 tables since it just came out this afternoon. I need to say something I was remiss in saying that the slide deck and particularly the charts, uh, they're all the product of my wonderful team at the Environmental Energy Law Program, Carrie Jenks, my executive director. And, and so it's really a team effort, but we like to show, we like to illustrate this stuff and simplify it because very few people are going to plow through that rulemaking, uh, the rule in the record. A couple of quick lightning ones from the audience. One of them is compliance. What happens if you don't follow the, reg the regs? Well, under the Clean Air Act, there are penalties. Um, all of this comes down to a Department of Justice as the agency's lawyer, right? The, the Department of Justice essentially represents the agencies and will enforce uh, rules against companies that are non-compliant. In the first instance, EPA does it. They administratively enforce their rules, and then they may require a court judgment to enforce it, and then the Department of Justice takes over. You partially answered the next question, which has to do with the timing of going into effect. And under normal circumstances, these go into effect, uh, you know, as soon as they come out in the federal register. Let's suppose that they're not stayed. But on the other hand, the litigation goes the litigation goes on, right? So go ahead. Yeah, I mean, the litigation in, in, in the instance of, you know, the SEC rule or this rule today is almost instantaneous. Um and again, they're seeking to get a stay. I'll say one thing about the SEC rule on climate-related financial disclosure. The challengers have challenged this rule, Republican-led states and uh, industry and the environmentalists who think it's not strong enough, have launched litigation in six federal circuit courts of appeal. Six! And so we have a process by which a judicial panel on multi-district litigation literally draws a circuit out of a, uh, by lottery randomly out of a bin to choose which circuit it'll be litigated in because everybody is forum shopping, trying to find a favorable circuit in which to challenge where they think they have um, sympathetic judges. The Fifth Circuit wasted no time granting review and staying the SEC rule. Now, when the lottery happens and uh, one circuit is selected, they can 
uh, displace that state. They will take over. But this is this is a competition among students to try to take charge of the litigation. And it's it's really quite interesting. And at least that stage, if I understand it, and you should correct me, doesn't happen with these EPA rules, which go directly to the D.C. Circuit. Right. So the Clean Air Act happens to say, go to the D.C. Circuit to challenge all federal rules, which, by the way, has certain virtue because they're somewhat of an expert in administrative law compared to other circuit courts. If I'm an auto company, suppose I'm an OEM and I'm thinking about, well, gosh, what am I going to ramp? Which of these compliance strategies? am I going to do? And I'm going to have to, even even though I'm making a lot of investments on batteries, when, when am I going to have resolution on all of these, on all of this litigation? Yeah, I've always said this, and I, I maintain this to be true. I think the most important thing for regulation is to be consistent and clear. Uh, and, you know, most industries, most companies within most industries and most sectors will just want clarity and consistency. Tell them what they need to do and they'll figure out how to do it. The problem is when you have these gyrations between administrations and you have inconsistency in the regulatory domain, it's very hard to go around making your product and selling it to consumers. So I don't think the ambition is the problem. I think the problem is inconsistency or lack of clarity. I think EPA has really done its level best here to say, we listen to you, we've changed the ramp up time, but we're still ambitious and you still got to get there. And there are lots of ways to get there. And this is a fleet wide average. So depending on the cars you make, you make a certain balance of vehicles, you'll have to sell a certain balance of vehicles, but we're in no way banning the internal combustion engine from your fleet. That's the narrative that they're very clearly countering with this rule. Would it be fair to say, maybe this is overly leading, would it be fair to say, uh, for many OEMs, the logic might be, well, the Chinese are going to be competing with me in battery electric vehicles in other parts of the world, maybe not by t because of tariffs so much in the U.S. I've got all of these incentives from the IRA. I have a certain probability, probably, a, you know, who knows how the litigation is going to turn out, but some probability that we're going to need uh, to have a lot of battery electric vehicles uh, in the U.S. We certainly know that's going to be the case. We think that's going to be the case in California and the other states that have signed on to the California waiver because they effectively have a, 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 an ICE ban in 2035. Sort of, the, the, sort of putting all of this together, it seems like there's a lot of legs to this stool and the pressure is you know, completely on to for the OEMs to be doing more EV build out. My general reaction is um, there is no longer any excuse to uh, try to stave off some electric vehicle transition. It is upon us. It is upon us globally, as you alluded to around the world. It's also true that we've never before had such a level of congressional investment in that transition in the form of billions of dollars for EV infrastructure. It takes some time to deploy, I grant you. And there's just no question that there's a level of support from Congress we've never had, commitments from the auto industry, they are investing billions of dollars. They may It may be a little rocky and uneven, but there's no question. We're seeing new battery plants uh, opening, we're seeing new investments, and labor, the question is to make sure that labor is also invested in this and has a path to transition uh, where they're also well taken care of um, as we move from internal combustion engines to vehicles that may have fewer component parts, right? So this is a complex problem, but to to me, the trajectory is very, very clear. We have a really interesting question, a nuanced question from uh, one of our colleagues, Bill Clark, who um, points out that as you're uh, in part of your role on, uh, on, on Harvard's efforts to decarbonize uh, its own campus and its own activities, you pointed out that we should be thinking perhaps more than just about um, greenhouse gases. We should be thinking about all of the other health damages that might be associated with fossil fuels. So then the question is, would anything in these regulations change or how much did these regulations take into account the non-CO2 or non-GHG parts of these emissions? And would things have changed if maybe there'd been more weight on that? So maybe you could explain how that factors in. I actually think that it's important to understand that EPA under the Clean Air Act has a public health mission. In other words, the only uh, way that EPA can set standards under the Clean Air Act is if it finds an endangerment to public health or welfare. And in this instance, they have an elaborate record supporting the finding that there is an endangerment to public health or welfare from climate pollution as well as 
conventional pollution like ozone and particulate matter. And they are setting standards for those pollutants as well. So this is a combination of rules. These GHG rules aren't in isolation. They occur alongside ozone regulation, PM regulation, other public health related standards. One thing I just want to make clear here is it's easy to listen to a talk like this and think, wow, bunches of regulation, super expensive. What a burden to the economy. This is terrible. I want to be clear here. These rules have cost benefit analysis attached to them, Jim, you know this very well, that show billions and billions of dollars in net benefits in large measure because of public health benefits to the American people. And historically, Clean Air Act rules have been both the most expensive rules and the most beneficial rules. So I just don't want us to lose track of the fact that these are legal mandates that the EPA is obligated to implement. It has a statute, a law telling it what to do, and it has an obligation to protect public health. And of course, the opposite side, so in a scenario in which uh, there's a new Trump administration, uh, they also, because of these legal mandates, have a floor on what they can do in terms of rolling it back. This goes to rollbacks, of course, which is it's not quite true that you can unwind everything. First of all, you have to go through a rulemaking to unwind it. That takes time. But secondly, you now have an elaborate record about what technologies are out there, methane technologies, new detection technologies that make it possible to find uh, leaks more easily, fugitive emissions. You've got technologies in the oil and gas sector. You have CCS, hydrogen, other technologies. Technology keeps evolving. So, of course, regulation must keep keep moving with it and take it into account. The whole idea of the Clean Air Act is that it's a technology forcing statute. It looks at technologies that are available, but perhaps not widely deployed. And it is fair game to set standards based on them because we know that the technologies become commercial and more pervasive over time. That's the, under, that's the main driver in the Clean Air Act. That's what EPA has done here. That's great. We have a couple of other um, questions that uh, go uh, thinking about this in the broader international context. So maybe you could just say a few more words on how these regulations do or don't contribute to meeting Paris targets. And then a related one is um, sort of thinking about that. So what role do these play in terms of our international our ability to do international negotiations? Yeah. So I'll take the second part first. I think it's absolutely critical when we go into international climate talks or, you know, any kind of international fora where climate is on the agenda, that we have credibility and that we're playing our role as a global leader. When the Trump administration, when President Trump announced that he was withdrawing the United States from the Paris Agreement, it just was such a blow to the effort, to the international climate effort. And when President Biden restored us and recommitted us to that agreement, it puts the wind back in the sails of international negotiations. We are an indispensable leader because, first of all, we're such a large historic emitter. But without us and China participating, it becomes very difficult to lead this effort. So so I think it really matters that we're seen to be working hard at it. I think the Inflation Reduction Act and the Infrastructure Bill, uh, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and the CHIPS Act were critical to say our Congress is actually doing something about this by at least doing industrial policy. I think it's important that the Biden administration has said, here's our ambitious national determined contribution, the 50 to 52 percent goal below 2005 levels. And these rules are key pillars of that commitment. I don't think it's quite right to try to say, well, the car rule will achieve only these emissions reductions and the power plant rule will achieve only these emissions reductions and so on, because the rules are really drivers and are supporting what's going on in the economy. So the idea is that these rules help to send a market signal and the market takes off because of it. So I think we can't fully project the emissions reductions, right, from each and every one of these rules. And part of it, it depends on the uptake of all the Inflation Reduction Act subsidies and investments and tax credits, which we also don't know. The idea is that there will be multipliers, right, and that there will be more uptake than predicted of these tax credits for CCS, for hydrogen, and for the rest. So I, I don't want to be pessimistic about this. I want to be optimistic about this. And I think setting these ambitious targets is really, really important, and sending these market signals is really, really important. So another way, if the, the, a short version, if I get it right, to say what you're arguing is that um, if you set, if, once these standards are set and there's some clarity, then the innovation is going to happen, and it actually won't be very expensive to achieve these
uh, regulations, and we've seen that in the past. Over and over again, we see it in the past. Everybody says the sky will fall, and then somehow industry figures out a way to do it, and they do it faster, and they do it cheaper. By the way, that is the story of the clean power plant. So this is great. So I'm going to have to ask a, a question on the SEC rule that's in the audience, but I will say that you're going to need to explain the question to us. Okay, so how do SEC rules compare with other jurisdictions on double materiality and other key provisions? So just explain that, please, for the non-lawyers and the non-accountants. I love this because, um, first of all, I'm not a corporate law professor. So, you know, I, I just want to make sure everybody appreciates that. But so the concept of double materiality is not the U.S. concept of materiality. We, we consider something material to a business that we need, we expect a company to disclose is what a reasonable investor would consider important to know, significant to know when making an investment decision. And if the failure to disclose that would have changed the total mix of information that a reasonable investor thinks they need to know to make a decision. And the reasonable investor standard is longstanding in the U.S., but it's related to financial materialities related to the financial health of the company, the ability of the company to deliver returns to shareholder. That's the American version. Double materiality refers to um, a notion of materiality that goes beyond strictly narrowly financial materiality, materiality in terms of health impacts or uh, climate impacts or uh, sustainability so that it's a broader concept of materiality that we have not really adopted yet in the U.S. There's a big debate about this. What the SEC has done, and, and by the way, that's the EU has adopted a kind of double materiality view from what I understand from the EU rule. In, in the SEC's rule package, they were extremely clear that they were adopting our traditional version of materiality and not trying to do something expansive or new, and trying to allow companies to determine that the transition risks they face, their GHG emissions are not material. But the burden is now on the companies to make that case, right? They, so, so there is a new obligation on them um, to disclose the information in the formats and in the way that the SEC is requesting it, a big part of the reason for requiring it is that it's trying to create a uniform way of reporting information that investors want, because there's a cacophony of demands or multiplicity of demands on companies to disclose. And the SEC is actually, I think the best way to view it is trying to simplify it, make it uniform. So in investors get the information they need in a consistent format. Okay. Well, that is a very um, a technical, but a extremely interesting note to uh, uh, to end this on. Thanks so much. Um, and I'd also like to thank the team at the Office of the Vice Provost for Advances of Learning for their production support and to the Harvard Alumni Association for their help with promotion and logistics. Thanks to the whole team. And thanks especially to you, Jody, for this thought-provoking discussion. Our next episode is going to be on Thursday, April 25th, and we'll discuss environmental justice and green infra infrastructure. So let me thank you, the audience, for joining us, and let me turn it back to the VPAL hosts. Thank you, Jody, and thank you, Jim. And thank you all for joining us tonight. We hope you'll join us for more signature events soon. Information about upcoming signature events as well as recordings of previous ones can be found at vpal.harvard.edu slash vpal events. Thank you.